The Civil War created a great divide in the United States as the Union Army faced off with the Confederate forces. Animosity increased with each battle. In many cases, this hatred hit very close to home because relatives found themselves on the opposing side. The war of brother versus brother took an incredible toll on the nation. When the rebels finally found their cause and the smoke of the battlefield dissipated, fear, loathing, and hatred still hung in the air, creating a defense of fog and uncertainty. So when they had lost their cause, all the things began to break loose. The fear, the loathing, the hatred. When the South surrendered, President Lincoln gave a speech to a crowd from the balcony of the White House. When asked what would happen to the rebels, Lincoln heard the angry crowd from below shouting, hang them. Eventually, wisdom came from Lincoln's 11-year-old son, Tad, who told his father, not hang them, hang on to them. The president recognized the powerful solution before him and decided to show his great mercy even when others demanded judgment. Our lesson today is titled Great Mercy. Our lesson is about our hearts. We must not begrudge God for showing mercy on others because we need God's mercy at all times. Praise the Lord. It's funny how we come to God needing mercy, but when we get a little bit down the road, we're not quite as willing to give mercy. And God wants to help us, amen, to learn how to be a merciful people, amen, because we do serve a merciful God, amen. And as little Tad said, don't hang them, let's hang on to them, amen. And that's our heart's desire today. It's a very, uh, it's a very hard thing in a world that we live in to deal with the hearts of people and at the same time, amen, uh, try to correct and bring into alignment with God in a very offensive world. We live in a world that is offended by everything. You have to be careful about what you say and how you say it and, and trying to be uh, correct in the way you say things. You have to be very careful or you offend somebody. And so... In, in the church, it's like a balancing act of trying to show people what God has for their life, that they can live better than they're living, and at the same time, not make them so mad they don't come back to talk to you to hear you preach anything else. Amen. It's a job. Amen. But we as pastors want to do our best. Some go all the way over to the left and don't preach a whole lot of uh, except for the except for you know the, the cross or maybe a few other things. Some go way over on the other side and they preach everything and try to figure everything out. And some way in the middle of all this confusion and all this craziness, we've got to find that place in the middle to be able to give the men and women and children the grace and the power of God to rise up and be disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God to take this great kingdom, this message to all the world. Amen. Praise God. God has given us this balance and we seek after it. Amen. I will tell you this morning, as a pastor, I can admit to you the hardest thing that I've ever done is to find balance. To find true balance in the kingdom of God. Amen. To seek the face of the Lord and try to find exactly what he has for us in our lives. Amen. For the scripture says to seek your own soul salvation with fear and and trembling and I don't know about you amen but I want to serve God to the best that I can amen praise the Lord and I believe that you want to do the same so our lesson today in Jonah 4 10 and 11 if you'll go there with me 
Jonah 4, 10 and 11. It says, Then the Lord, then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither made it to grow, which it came up in a night, and it perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein there are more than six scorn thousand, which is 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and there's much cattle. Most of us know the story of Jonah. When we look at the story of Jonah, we understand he was a prophet that was running from God. Uh, the Bible says that he was t instructed by God to go to Nineveh and preach to the people. But there was a problem here. Uh, Jonah did not like the people of Nineveh. The truth is Jonah was a preacher with a grudge. Amen. Jonah was a preacher that had a problem. Amen. And, and so just because you're a preacher don't mean you may not have a problem, but he had a problem. And he didn't want to go, so he decided to run from God. How many knows what that, that's like? Amen. To try to run from God. Amen. You can't, you can't run from God. You can't hide from God. But he went to Tarish and got on a, on, a, on a ship and went down in the bottom of the ship. And as they got out there in the sea, a great storm caused by God. Amen. Begin to uh, begin to uh, rock the ship, and 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 so we know most of the story. They cried out to their God, and finally they woke up. Uh, they woke up Jonah, and and Jonah ends up getting through over the over the boat, and uh, and the Bible says that God prepared a great fish to swallow him up, <coughs> and so after getting swallowed by the fish. And I know many of us have probably uh, remember times when you've been in a dark place. Sometimes it's in a jail cell. Other times it's in a hospital room. Something that stops us in our tracks and makes us think. God is a good God. I said God is a good God. And He knows what's best for us when we don't even know what we need ourselves. God knows what we need. And every now and then, Brother Kyle, he's got to put his foot on our coattail and stop us dead in our tracks. And that's what happened to Jonah. And that's what happened to many of us. I don't know about you, but I didn't find God in the church. Or God didn't find me in the church. I was in a messed up situation. I was in a situation where I probably wouldn't live another day. I was in a situation, it was so dark, I could not see light. Amen. I was in a situation that it seemed like nobody wanted to help me. Amen. But God. Amen. And there, in that dark place, amen, God touched me. And Jonah was in this belly of this fish for Three days and something about being in the belly of a fish. Can you imagine? Amen. I, I freak out on thinking about going in a submarine. <clears throat> I think about submarine. Them guys that went in submarines and are down in the depths of the ocean. I mean, you talk about claustrophobic, man. I've been coming out of that thing. I've been getting in a missile tube telling them hit the button or something. Get me out of here, Brother Dester. I'd have been freaking out. But can you imagine how Jonah must have felt? I mean, he's in the belly of a fish. There's seaweed. There's... Crabs and lobsters and Jonah. And in that darkness, he turned back to the Word of God. <laughs> in that place, in that depth, in that pit, in that darkness, he began to speak the Word of God. And one of the things he said, those that listen to lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Have you ever heard the devil tell you you was no good? Have you ever heard t people tell you you're, you're worthless and you're not ever going to make anything? And, 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 and all them voices, people that listen to lying vanities forsake their own mercy. And I pray on this Sunday morning that God would stop up our ears from the devil and open our ears to what heaven has to say. Amen. That there is mercy in this house today. Somebody give God a great big praise. So Jonah 
you, this is this is this is a crazy picture. When he repents, the fish pukes, and out come walking from the fish puke comes a prophet, seaweed dripping off of his head. And he's ready to answer the call of God. When he gets to Nineveh and, and, and the people of Nineveh, amen, they repent. And it makes Jonah mad. He don't want them to repent. He's angry. He's bitter. He's resentful. Have you ever been there? He, he is all that. And he's just, just so upset. But they repent, amen, and they give their hearts to God. And he's mad and he's angry. And he said, I knew that's what you was going to do. And he finds himself out, amen, upset. Amen. Setting in the uh, setting in the desert, and God causes a gourd to grow up, and it gives him shade from the sun. But all, God also sends a worm. I'm telling you, sometimes the things that happen in your life, when things begin to dissipate and fall apart, isn't hell. Sometimes God will let stuff get destroyed. That's going to take you down and mess you up. That worm eats the gourd, and the gourd dies, and Jonah wakes up, and he's mad. And God said, you didn't have nothing to do with the gourd growing. But God didn't tell him, I, I, I put that there for you. And then I destroyed it to get your attention. And so he's upset and God says, what's more important? What, what's more important here is, is it a gourd or 120,000 people? Now I want you to catch this part because this, this is the part that, that'll get, he said that they neither know what their left hand or the right hand is doing. He said they don't know what they're doing. They're messed up. And you know, I have, I have told people before, been in congregations of people, I've been in prisons preaching to people, to a certain group, drug addicts, murderers, you name it. And go over to talk to another group of, group of people, Brother Destry, and the whole room gets mad at me. What are you talking to them people oh, yeah. for? Because, see, it's funny how we want mercy for our own crazy little situations, but many times we don't want to give it to somebody else. Praise God. Come on. Amen. We don't want to give it to other people. And, 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 I, and something I have learned, amen, as I have got a little older here, God has been teaching me some stuff, but something that I have learned, amen, the people are different. When it's their children. Oh, I mean, they'll crack the whip on this and they'll crack the whip on that. But you let one of their kids go that way. And their whole gospel changes. They're no longer going on about that. They're no longer upset about that. I mean, I know people, man, they, they, they preach if you was ever remarried, you was going to hell. And next thing you know, one of their kids get remarried and that kind of preaching stops. Because see... It's real easy to judge people. My wife said something to me years ago that stuck in my heart. She said to me, it's real easy to talk about people, but it's really tough when you're the one they're talking about. And that's how it is. And, and God wants to help us today. He wants us to give the same mercy to every person that has been given to us because God is good. I tell stories about Jeffrey Dahmer getting saved. I mean, this dude ate people. You know, he was, you talk about a sinner of sinners. I mean, the honest truth is, and I've told you this before, but when I got saved, I was reading Max Lucado, Grip of Grace, and read about Jeffrey Dahmer, and I said, I've done some bad stuff, God, but I ain't never ate nobody. I mean, I was trying to bribe God into loving me, and God was the one that sent the book. You know, God was the one that was trying to get me out of where I was, but I was trying to bribe God. Like, God, I ain't, I ain't been ever no Jeffrey Dahmer, and you helped him, you know, and God was there. It wasn't God that had to change. Guess who had to change? It was Pete Aldrich. It was my thinking. Come on, somebody. I was keeping myself hostage because those that listen to lying vanities forsake their own mercy so what god says and what jonah don't understand see because jonah may have had family members killed by these people in nineveh yeah. cities had been ridiculed killed. these people were dangerous they they didn't care about anything or anybody and they didn't show mercy even the little children right. jonah knew all that but something that Jonah didn't know that God was trying to tell him 
that their right hand never knew what their left hand was doing. They were confused. They were messed up. They didn't understand. God was trying to show jo uh, Jonah that these people have no idea what they're doing. And when he told them and he spoke to them, immediately repentance come up on their heart. And I'm telling you, there's a world full of people. Come on, somebody. You can't... You can't look for worthy people to preach to. People go by. I remember Jack Godfrey used to sing a song. Good old boys won't make it into heaven. Good old boys won't wear a crown. Good old boys won't live forever where the saints of God are found. Because being good won't get you to heaven. Being good. The Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags. Your, your righteousness. But the righteousness of God is pure and holy and, and life changing and mesmerizing. Come on. The holiness of God. Praise the Lord. The mercy of God will change your life and cause other lives to change. Amen. That's what the mercy of God does. Amen. Praise the Lord. I wish you'd tell somebody the mercy of God is contagious. So God's trying to let Jonah know these people don't know what they've been doing. Amen. James 4 and 17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, then it is sin. So we understand now that where we've been, I mean, I never woke up one day when I was a kid and went to school and they said, What do you want to be? I said, well, I'd like to be a junkie. That didn't happen. Nobody ever woke up and said, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a murderer. I want to be, uh, come on. I, 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 no, nobody ever did that. That's not how it is. And that's how God wants us to understand. People, amen, have the uh, ability to go wrong and do things wrong. Because I'm telling you, amen, that Adamic nature lives in all mankind. That little baby that you're holding. I seen a little baby here a little bit ago with a bottle in its mouth. So cute. It's going to grow up. Yeah. Probably slap somebody right upside the head. If it's anything like any of my grandkids, it'd be dangerous. And then they get a little older. And then they get a little older. Yeah, and, and mouthy, yeah. And so it's in them, but we don't know what's in them. We don't know what's in us. I've sat with some of the best people I ever met in my life behind prison doors that's never coming out. I sat with some of the coolest people, the most real people that were just coming into Branchville after doing 50 years in a maximum security prison and they're leveling down to their last eight years. And to tell a crazy story how they went to a party at 18 years old, got in a fight. One guy told me, somebody went out with my wife, I was only 18, and he came outside and he mouthed off to me, and I hit him, and I hit him, and before I knew it, he was dead, and he was my best friend. And I've been in prison for 30 some years. And I'm leveling out now, I've got seven years left. This dude was a giant of a man, he was kind, he was tender. He was so sorry he had taken his own friend's life. He never got up in high school and said, now, when I graduate from high school, I'm going to kill my best friend. What I'm trying to let you know today is this, that we all need mercy. There's not a person in here. The mercy of God can change your life forever. Now I want you to understand something. Amen. The mercy of God comes to save us and change us and pick us up and turn us around and set our feet on solid ground. Praise God. The mercy of God is here on this Sunday morning to change somebody. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now let me take you a little deeper this morning. Luke 12, 47 and 48. I want you to hear this because it deals with, you know, we're, we're still talking about their left hand didn't know what their right hand was doing. 
So God wanted to give them mercy. Luke 12, 47, 48 says, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not did prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. That person that knew, they got beat with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For, ev for everyone to whom much is given... From him much will be required. It's a little scary, ain't it? You know what somebody told me one time? <laughs> Tell you the truth, you know what I thought one time? Out in the middle of my craziness and all the stuff I was doing, I was thinking, I wish I'd have never knew God. Somebody told me one time, said, I wish I would have never knew what I know now. Because I know now that I'm going to be held accountable for what I know. Jesus is trying to let us know here that when he brings us into this life and we begin to know him, we become more accountable. It's like I didn't know what I was going to be. I didn't know what I could do. I didn't know I would end up in that kind of mess. But now that I know it's up to me to stay out of it because God's given me the knowledge and the understand. And I understand if I do that, I'm going to get this. Come on, somebody. God has brought me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And now I know. I didn't know then. I never had any idea what it was like to sit in a maximum security sale and go out, amen, when they give you a set. Hey, anybody want to go to wreck? And you say, yeah, I want to go. And you go and it's four concrete rooms with a cage on top of it. That freaked me out. And the only thing I could see was the sky. And I thought underneath that sky somewhere is my family. And if there's any way I could ever get to them. And it depressed me so bad I didn't go back out to wreck for months. I didn't know all that. I didn't know that's where I was going to end up. And you didn't know where you was going to end up. And people on the radio today didn't know they was going to end up stuck in alcoholism and drug addiction and all them other kind of things. But I'm telling you, there's a God full of mercy that can bring us up and bring us out and change our lives forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to, in the first service, praise the Lord, uh, Sister Jamie got her nurse's license. Uh, and I wanted to wanted to bring that up, but we have and Sister Pam, she uh, graduated. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Didn't you just get through school, right? All kinds of A's, if I remember, huh? Who would ever thought, Brother Destry? Who would ever thought these girls would go get these degrees? I'm, I mean, I haven't even got my GED yet. And my kids are out graduating from college. I mean, what's this about? I mean, I'm going to be, yeah. Terry doesn't know I got signed up to get my diploma. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. 55 years old, amen, praise the Lord. Now, I could be upset. Little heathens come in underneath my ministry, bless the Lord. I've been doing this for years, and here they come. Sister Catherine just strutting up in there, learning all this psychology and sociology and talking all this stuff, amen. Sister Danielle getting all these crazy grades and all this stuff. And I, you could get, if you're not careful, you can get an attitude. Instead of just being thankful that everything around you can outgrow you. And that's the way it ought to be. And our attitudes and our spirits. Come on. Amen. See, this is what the devil's afraid of. If you get this great mercy, it is so contagious to other people. I never thought when I got saved and we were starting a lighthouse that it would... So many people would get an opportunity to come recovery and meet Jesus Christ as he really is and change their lives. I never thought nothing about it. The truth is, the truth is when I started that class, I started it for me. 
We had to move a refrigerator from the house and I never had nobody I could trust to call over to help me move the refrigerator. And I thought, man, you know, how am I, who, who do I get here? Then I thought there must be other people that's as lonely as I am. My church was in Vincennes. I had nobody to hang out with. My brother was still getting high. I couldn't hang out with my brother. Life was crazy. Everybody I knew. I thought, well, we'll just start a little 12-step class. Ha! Huh. Here we are. You know, 15, 16 years later, we've got these facilities, and God is just going crazy on people. And lives are getting wrecked. Come on, amen. And I'm, and, and, Sister Jamie, I just told everybody you got your nurse's license. Amen. She's on Facebook having this little Holy Ghost fit crying and my wife said what is she doing i said she's having a fit so i guess we'll play it she says oh, she got it she got it but ain't it good to be a part of the kingdom and so so what i'm telling you what i'm telling you is this great mercy is so contagious that it can change everything around you. It can change your city. It can, come on, it can change your family. It can change everything because, because what happens when you receive that mercy and then you begin to walk in it. And I want to show you something real quick. When you receive that mercy and you begin to walk in it and you get that knowledge and understanding, at that moment you become responsible for your own recovery. Your own life of godliness. Now you know. Your left hand knows what your right hand's doing. What do they tell us in recovery? They say play the tape forward and then rewind it. What happened the last time you acted that way? What happened the last time you did that? You're, I ain't doing that no more. I ain't going that way anymore. I'm not acting that way anymore. I, I told him in the first service I had a... I had a talking to a young lady that I've worked with for quite a while and um, her husband said come on let's go for a bike ride she said no you you only have your permit he said come on it won't hurt one time she said uh uh that's like somebody asking go have a couple beers it won't hurt to have one she said, if it's wrong, it's wrong. And if it's right, it's right. Get your license and then I'll ride with you. And then she asked me the question. She said, Bishop, was I right? I said, was you right? When you finally learn to connect the dots to sinful nature instead of addiction, doing what's right, righteous, right, doing what's right, going the right way, doing the right things. Come on, somebody. You can't go wrong doing right. Amen. And you need to thank God for the mercy of God in your life today. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's that, it's that little thing. Like somebody called me the other day and, 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 and they was telling, or I was talking to him the other day and they was telling me, you know, they, they was in Walmart, one of our guys, and he was buying this stuff and everything was awesome. And he got this stuff and it got out and he looked, and he grabbed the batteries, but he didn't pay for the batteries. He said, what am I going to do? He starts feeling convicted. So I said, what, did you take them back in and tell them that you accidentally carried their batteries out? He said, no, I was so embarrassed. He said, I went through the door. I brought the batteries. The lady said, so you're bringing the batteries back. He said, he went on, he by her, he went around. He said, I just got in line and paid for them. <laughs> But wasn't there a time we had said, hey, boy, I must have got blessed. They forgot to add them batteries up. Huh? Or somebody give you an extra $20 bill. Oh, praise the Lord, I got blessed today. Or does your spirit say, I need to do what's right? Because this is where we get, and God wants to help us. Listen, I'm going to say this again. You can never go wrong doing right. And let me say this. The longer you wait to make something right, the harder it is. Like, just think if he would have waited till next week with them batteries. And next week, he's going to walk in and say, hey, man, I got these batteries. You know what I mean? He said it was just so embarrassing, you know, humbling. And he went in and he paid for the batteries. When you take care of stuff quick, praise God, when you're wrong, what do you do? Quickly admit it. 
So, so let me let me help you with a couple things here, real quick. Mary Magdalene, how many knows who she is? She was the woman from whom Jesus cast seven demons. When great mercy hit her, it changed her and she never went back. Did you hear what I said? She never went back. The truth is, hey, the truth is, when the disciples all left Jesus, Mary stuck with him. She stuck with him because she found the mercy that she was looking for and she was free by the power of God and she felt that mercy in her life. And now today in our contemporary messed up world, they put movies out that try to say, well, Jesus was in love with Mary and you know, all this crazy stuff and you know, just trying to mix up the Bible. But here's, let me tell you what the Bible says about Jesus. He was nothing to look at. I mean, he wasn't good looking like me. <laughs> just kidding but he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't a good looking man she wasn't attracted to his physical she was attracted to the mercy that she had received and you and I in this place today when we deeply fall in love with Jesus it's because he gave us mercy that we did not deserve and we know it and people think we're crazy because we start putting on Jesus shirts and we start talking about Jesus everywhere we go and I like that one shirt that said you better watch out because I'll start talking about Jesus any minute and the thing is, we wear the shirt, but we mean it. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to tell people about Jesus, amen, because we got mercy and we're attracted. Amen. I, I never seen him, but I'm attracted to his glory and his splendor and his kindness and his compassion. And this Mary from whom these demons were cast, she found mercy that caused her to follow him all the days of her life. <laughs> there was this other crazy dude. And he's naked. Running around in a graveyard. Now friend that's off the hook. You know that's off the hook. This dude is. He, he's naked. Running around in the graveyard. And then he's got rocks. He's cutting himself. Screaming. Hey they take chains and they wrap him up in chains and he breaks them. He breaks the fetters. Nothing could hold him. This dude is a freak. I'm talking freaky. Okay, I've been crazy. I've been spun out. I've been messed up, but I ain't never been naked in the graveyard running around. <laughs> Jesus comes in on the boat, the demons that were in him screamed out and he fell down and worshipped at Jesus' feet. Jesus cast them out, put them in the pigs. The pigs drowned themselves. And the next thing you know, he tries to get back on the boat with Jesus because who don't want to hang out with Jesus? Right? But Jesus says, hold on, no. No, you can't go with me. You go back and tell them what great things that I have done. <laughs> and Jesus and his disciples get in a boat and leave the dude. The whole city freaked out. They were scared and ran Jesus off. So this, this guy that is like one of the first evangelists, one of the first, he goes to tell them what great things Jesus had done. Can you imagine? They said, what else do you know about Jesus? Nothing. <laughs> he gave me mercy. What doctrine is he? I'm not sure. He gave me mercy. Who else was with him? I'm not sure. But look, he gave me mercy. He's clothed and in his right mind. And his testimony of mercy is speaking to the whole countryside. And the crazy thing is... Sister Kendra, when, happy birthday, when I was going to, 
have him come and sing for you. But you want to sing her after a while? Okay. Um, when the boat comes back, the whole city gladly received Jesus. Not because the man went to theologian school. Not because he was indoctrinated. Not because he knew everything in the Torah and all the other. Come on. But what he knew was <laughs> that that touched him was real and forgiving. And nobody else could help him but the one that came off that ship by the name of Jesus. Come on. Woo! Amen. Somebody said it ain't what you know, but it's who you know. Amen. Aren't you glad on this Sunday morning that you know Jesus? Amen. Give him a great big praise and tell him I love you, Lord. I love you. 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 The definition of mercy is <laughs> kindness or good towards the miserable and afflicted. Now watch this, it, but it goes further than that. Kindness and good toward the miserable or afflicted joined with the desire to help. It has action. Whew. So mercy doesn't just go, hey, You're okay. No. Mercy reaches down. <laughs> story after story. The woman that was caught in adultery. The law said she should die. She's condemned. And here they come and cast her at the feet of Jesus. And says the law says this. What should we do? <laughs> and mercy... Gets down on his knees. And he starts writing in the dirt. Come on, he's writing. Whatever he's doing. Some people says he might have been writing what them guys have been doing the night before. Other, other people say he may have wrote who was peeking in the window to catch her while she was in adultery. Huh? We don't know what he wrote. But we know this. One by one, they dropped their rocks and they turned and walked off. And Mercy said, where are thine accusers? She says, I have none, Lord. <laughs> he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That mercy is in this house today. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The great mercy of God is in this house this morning, praise the Lord. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His mercy. Can I close? Can I close with this? How can they hear? Except there be a preacher. Brother Scott, this is the toughest thing in ministry that I find. Is how can they hear except there be a preacher? And how can he preach except they be sent? Because when you have a call of God in your life, you also have a weight. And that weight sometimes is heavy because you know what it takes to help them make it. And you're trying to help them make it. But you also know they got an attitude. And you're trying to work through their attitude so you can give them that thing that's going to help them make it all the way. But you know that they're mixed up and one hand don't know what the other hand's doing. And some way you got to learn them and teach them and walk with them and love them and show them. And, and while you're doing that at the same time, not run them off. But keep them in the fold. I talked to, I talked to Brother Dalton the day. He said, I felt, he said, I felt shunned. I said, you look shunned. I said, but Bubba, you ain't getting shunned here. We love you. You're awesome. We just got some stuff to work on. You ain't getting shunned. We don't do no shunning here. We catch anybody shunning, they're going to be in trouble. I'm not going to shun you. Had a lady come today. Years ago, at the 
Women's Lighthouse. There was a note found. She kept telling her this was her cousin, her friend that was coming to visit. <clears throat> Come to find out, Sister Pam, it was her girlfriend. Somebody found the note, and the note told the whole story. I said, we need to have a talk. I said, okay. I said, you know what our rules say. And the rules are Bible-based, but there's no men with men, women with women. She said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, it's real simple. She can't come visit no more. She said, are you serious? I said, I'm real serious. I said, sis, I know you got feelings. But I also know you want to be saved. And I know Jesus loves you and we love you too. We accept you just like you are. We just can't accept that lifestyle. We won't. But we're here for you. And we love you. And boy, we had words and we butted heads. It was pretty wild. She ended up working for another church here in town. The preacher walked out, found out what was going on. The girl had snuck out there and seen her. And, uh, he came out and called her everything. It made me so mad. Uh, he didn't cuss, but he might as well have. It made me mad. She cried. <laughs> I, I wouldn't even tell you what she said. She was she's a character, and uh, <laughs> no, she said it takes one to know one. That's that's what she said. <laughs> she she was mad. Uh, it's been a long time ago, so nobody will figure out who I'm talking about or where it was. But just kept showing her mercy. Telling her God had a better life for her. This morning, I look up, and there she is in church. So, Pastor Pete, threw her arms around me. I said, I love you, sis. I said, I love you too. She's hit me on Facebook before and said, Thank you so much for being honest, being a man of God. Thank you for helping me change my life. Thank you for helping me get back in the lives of my children and get where I need to be. Thank you. Mercy. Kindness. Or good will towards the miserable and afflicted join with the desire to help. Our desire today here at VCC is a place of hope and healing. Where all people are welcome. All people. All kinds. No matter what. Are welcome to come and heal. A place of grace and place of mercy. Well mercy can be given. And then. Passed out. To other people. Let's stand today. Here's what I feel in my spirit today. That there are people here right now that feel the tug of God's mercy in their life. And that you're... Can I tell you something crazy? See? Brother Terry, when I quit doing dope, I, it ticked me off. Because I, I, I like to get high. I'm serious. You think, you think I'm, mind you, ask my wife. I had a doctor's bag with needles, glass needles, changeable needles, blood pressure cup, stethoscope. I do a shot of dope and listen to my heart. Blah, 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 blah. I go to dope dealers' houses and they, they, they didn't even shoot up themselves. They, they didn't, but they wanted me to figure out what dope was made for who. I'm listening to how fast my heart beat. That's the stuff right there. I didn't want to quit. I had a hole in my arm. I had a hole in my arm. I still got the scar. I'm standing out in the 
A dope dealer said, that thing saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. I was lost. <laughs> I listened to that song, the hole in daddy's arm, that's where the money goes. And Jesus died for nothing, I suppose. I had friends that were shooting up between their toes and, and, and I knew it wasn't very long for all my veins were going to be gone. They were shooting up in their, in their toes and under their arms and trying to hit main arteries and do whatever they could do to get another shot of dope. That's the life that I was living and I didn't want to quit. But somewhere, <laughs> on a crazy night, I mean, I guarantee you, my wife can remember it like it was yesterday. I stole a, I stole a, a, a large uh, uh, arrowhead from a, a man, and he come after it and come to my house with guns, and I had to go down to the jail to do the weekend on one of the crazy. I was so strung out I couldn't hardly talk. My whole, my arms were full of holes. I, I was so messed up that when I'd open my mouth, this I told him I had a cold, I had the flu, I had pneumonia. That's why I couldn't talk. But I couldn't talk because I was dehydrated. I had an eight in days. I'd been up only thing I was doing was shooting dope that was messed up amen but you know what amen little did I know the mercy amen my mom and my grandma had been praying and mercy had come running amen praise the Lord I ended up in a jail called Gibson County Jail and there the grace of God found me and my mom told me later on she said Pete I seen it she said I was praying for you and I seen death standing right in front of you but she said mercy come running I seen a white sheet of God's grace and it cut death off I didn't want to quit Austin I didn't want to stop but mercy somebody's in their head right now and you're saying man I don't know about all this I'm not sure I want all that but if you'll just let mercy come running if you let the power of God amen he will change when I first got saved they showed me I went to a class and they had a rat but they gave cocaine and methamphetamine when that rat first came out he would only come out in the dark He'd slide down the wall and he'd go eat his cocaine and he'd go, do you know after a few weeks they put that cocaine out in the middle of the day and the very nature of the rat had changed. he come walking out on his hind feet looking. Went straight to the cocaine and ate it and looked at the cameras and looked at the people around because he didn't care because his nature had been changed. That's when I realized that God was a nature changer. Come on, amen. The things that it seemed, come on, amen, that seemed natural now seem crazy because God brings us from the darkness to the light of God. And He is in this place right now. I want to, every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to open this altar. As your heart vehemently pounds in your chest, you know I need change. I need that mercy that Mary Magdalene found. I need that mercy that the Demonton Heck that called himself Legion for the demons were many. I need that mercy. And I want to come today to the altar of God. And I want to ask the Lord Jesus to come in my life and give me that mercy. If you're here today and you're looking for that mercy, I'd like for you to step out of your seat. Don't worry about anybody around you. Just step out of your seat. Come to this altar. Amen. For the mercy of God has brought you Jonah's vehicle was a fish to get him to the mercy of God. I don't know what your vehicle I don't know what court system, what jail I don't know 
who invited you or why you're here, but the mercy of God is here on this morning for you to ask Him, Lord, I'm not just going to surrender just a part of me, God. I'm not going to I'm just going to I'm just going to come to you and just let you have me because you're the potter and I'm the clay. I'm not going to tell you how to mold me or make me. I'm not going to say do it this way or do it that way. But I'm going to I'm going to on this Sunday morning. I'm going to say, Lord, you you are able to do what I need done. And I'm not going to fight with you. I'm not going to argue with you, but I'm going to yield my heart right now. And I'm going to say, Jesus, just come in my life. Come in my heart. Jesus, I've tried on my own and I've failed. And I know you're a carpenter. And I know I'm a building. And I'm telling you just to come inside and rearrange every room. God, move the furniture. Move everything that you've got to move. But make this house house for your mercy and for your glory God and on this Sunday morning Jesus as I bow before you and I repent I know that the very blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary is coming down over me right now Father I know that that blood washes white as snow God and I know that that blood is the pure mercy of God and and that it changes us from the inside out So God, I just pray right now for a radical, dramatic change in my life. I pray that you do for me what I can't do for myself. I pray, God, that you just open my heart and make me that person that you want me to be, God. Rearrange everything. Make me pure. Make me holy. Make me righteous, Jesus. Help me right now. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I receive you, God, just like Mary did, Lord. And I receive you, Lord Jesus. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, Lord, any longer run from you, but I'm running to you. Lord, and I want to be free on this Sunday morning. I want to be free in your presence. I want to be free. God, and I'll give you the praise. I'll give you the glory. I'll give you the honor. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody clap your hands and give the Lord some praise this morning. Amen.